Hey everybody, welcome back to the Quest for the Bestest. It's the podcast for Backlog Banter where we view every single Best Picture winner and give each of them a little score. Today, we are going to be discussing and scoring The Sound of Music, directed by Robert Wise, of course, starring Julie Andrews, Christopher Plummer, Eleanor Parker, and more. I can't wait to talk about this film. It's uh, it's quite the musical. It's quite the 60s film. Um, and I think that we have some thoughts that we'll go back and forth and discuss this film. It's quite famous. It's quite famous, and I can't wait to hear what you guys' thoughts are on it. But before we discuss that film, we have our little incy-weensy bit of housekeeping to do. I guess what Julie Andrews' character was hired to do in The Sound of Music. Um, last time, we gave it to the audience to do... They explicitly have a housekeeper who is not her. Mm -hmm. Oh, I guess. I guess you're right. There's a difference between yeah. the governess and the... <laughs> governess is like a mom for hire. Okay, yeah. last week, we talked about me. A Man for All Seasons, and we gave it up for the audience to decide where it goes. And so I'm going to give this little segment off to Tucker because of the th or Abram or someone will have the featured Wait. comment and let us know where a man for all season ends up on our great big list. Timo, it's it's a busy section here, the, the comment section. We're actually both going to be reading one because we should probably say, by the way, that we intended to record this one two weeks after the last one because we're going to be going bi-weekly for a period of time. Uh, we are all very busy with the old school and the old job, and you all were very busy leaving comments, so you're getting two from us today. And oh, yeah. the first one comes from our treasured son, John Tour 11, who says on our review of A Man for All Seasons, Yeah, not much to shout about when it comes to this movie. This time period in history has some very interesting power shifting in Europe, both politically and religiously, that made a great impact later on. And Henry VIII was one of those reasons, because he couldn't keep his pants on when women were around. <laughs> but this British story of the internal power struggles at the time does not interest many outside the UK. To be fair, some fantastic actors here, Robert Shaw is amazing and Paul Schofield is wonderful, and I can't believe John Hurt from Alien is in this. There's a reason that this Best Picture winner is forgotten. Four out of ten. Nicely done. I've only seen Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf from this year, and it might be a bit dated, but it is so much better. And of course, this score, the score alone in Chariots of Fire beats this, no contest. As, yeah. soon as, you, as soon as you said Sound of Music, I immediately started yodeling The Lonely Goat Herd in my head. That music is diabolical. The songs are earworms that stick with you for months unless you beat them out with a bat. Next Jesus. week will be a challenge for my sanity. John Tor, we'll get to the music soon enough. But thank you for vindicating the correct opinion and litigating on the right side of history. In well, he kind of indirectly between. said, because he said the score was better. <laughs> but but yeah. his yeah. score he gave was better. I don't know. <laughs> He says that the score alone in Chariot's Fire beats this. He, he means to say that just that one aspect is better than this entire film. Ah, ah, so, fair, fair. So John Tor, as usual, the, 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 a man of great change in the program. He mm -hmm. was the impetus for us changing the entire ranking seasons. system. A man yes. for all seasons. He has litigated Chariot's of Fire goes above. And, and therefore, A Man for All Seasons numerically will end up at the spot 67 for now on the list. And so, we have one more featured comment, and then we can dive in and um, get on our jolly old little... <laughs> yeah, uh, so, over the last couple of weeks, we've got a, a, a absolute slurry of comments across Quest history saying that we're wrong about our opinions. And you know what? Hey, that's what, what the usual Quest comment is. No, I didn't think it was possible. What? But that's what the, that's what the average Quest comment is. And I really appreciate long, in-depth comments, even if they do ultimately disagree with us. And I've been responding uh, to them with, with something of that effect. But we do have a, a shorter one here um, from our last Emperor review from uh, Tash Kenti, who says, Unfortunately, all, you've got, all of you guys are inaccurate. The last 15 minutes of this film is the most critical and emotional part. Hu Yi, looking at the throne he once sat on, was a bittersweet contrast of elegy, looking back at his life as an emperor that was useless in the first place, and appreciating his current state as a gardener, which is for the first time he achieved happiness. The cricket he offered to the child who sat playfully on the throne was surprisingly heartwarming. I'm sad that you guys don't appreciate the subtle emotional shading of the film's ending. It's definitely a top. It's definitely in my top three of all time, together with Moonlight. So uh, yeah, he yeah. really disagrees with us about that movie. Well. Uh, I'm glad to hear that I'm f completely free of blame in that because I was not on that episode. So uh, I agree with the commenter. You guys are all wrong and stupid, and you don't understand understand subtlety or whatever. And if I yeah. if I remember that episode, I also agree with the commenter because you guys are all wrong, and that movie isn't boring. <laughs> Brother, I don't remember what that movie's about. Thank you for the <laughs> comment. Brother, let me tell you. <laughs> 
Well, hopefully we all remember what this movie is about, The Sound of Music, 1965. Yeah, I think so. Someone who hasn't spoken yet, which is going to be Tanner, you haven't done any segments yet this, this nope. episode. What is the plot synopsis of The Sound of Music? The Sound of Music takes place in the last years of the 1930s, set in the high Alps of, the, of Austria. Um, and if you're familiar with, uh, if you're even vaguely familiar with world history around this time, uh, you'll, uh, you'll be understanding some of the, some of the things going on in the background. But nonetheless, we're not concerned with that for now. We are concerned with the story of one Maria, what's her name? Maria. So Maria something. She was an orphan. She grew up in a convent, but she doesn't really, you know, she and this convent life, they don't really jive together. And the nuns understand that. And they're like... Maria, you got to get out of here. You got to go to this house that has seven kids and a really strict dad. And you got to teach them how to have fun and play and love each other and stuff like that. And she does. Through the sound and the power of music, she uh, she you know, sort of breaks these kids free of their, their dad's militaristic rule and uh, softens the heart of the, uh, of, uh, what's the dad's name in this? Captain, oh, G- Georg. Georg. Yeah, Captain Georg von Trapp. Yeah, Georg von Trapp, she softens the heart of Georg von Trapp uh, until ultimately they are forced out of Austria by Nazi occupation. Yeah. And that's where we end. Yeah. That's where we end. Thanks for watching. Peace. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'll no, go no, first. no, no, no. The movie. I'll go <laughs> first. Oh, okay. Uh, Abram, so... take us away. Thank you very much, Tanner. Yeah. I thought this movie was great. Yeah. Now, now it felt it felt to me like uh, Sound of Music was was a kind of glaring uh, omission from my my pre quest knowledge of Best Pictures, right? Because this is yeah. a film that's pretty damn ubiquitous. I mean, my mom loves this movie. My my mom's favorite movie is Fifty First Dates. What does she know about cinema? Very little. But but this is a film that is just sort of like a generational classic. And so going into it, I kind of was I wouldn't say I had high expectations, but I was looking for something that was sort of transcendent of even quest for the best is because yes these are the most acclaimed films from every year but they're not all of the same quality and yeah. to me this is what i'm looking for at a quest for the best this is a film that is important that i wouldn't probably have watched otherwise i ended up really enjoying i i think that the the soundtrack is one of the best musical soundtracks that i have heard uh i i think that it is a very endearing cast of characters but I think the movie is way too long. Mm. Wow. Um, Who could have seen that one coming? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I can't wait for about 20 minutes in, and I'll, audience, keep track of this, for Abram to say, I would have liked to see this scene added or this scene added. Just keep track of that. Just keep track of that. Yeah, we'll, 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 keep, we'll keep that in mind because I probably yeah. will contradict myself as I always do. But I, Yeah, that's all right. I feel like, and we're talking about this in, the, in our WhatsApp group because I texted at one point, like, this movie just keeps going. Uh-huh. And my problem isn't the last 30 minutes, because the last 30 minutes, I feel like they're a completely different movie. But that's fine yeah. to me. It just feels like we, we meander for two and a half hours. And I think that meandering could have been cut down. Maybe you get rid of the whole Baroness plot line that is, I think, just kind of wasting time or whatever. I don't know. I think you could have made this film shorter. And if you had, I think I would have been totally in love with it. But as it stands, I, I thought it was great. But I just kept checking my phone. I'm like, you can't. You, can, you kidding me? So, <laughs> not where I come down on sound of music. All right, I kind of want to go next. I want to follow up Abram's go thoughts. I'm right below him. I also like sound of music. I similar found myself in a similar position, having not seen it before, um, but having heard just about every single song, as it's kind of impossible to escape the soundtrack. Yeah. Um, yeah. And John Tor's right; those are earworms that get in that you know prepare to have a worm in your ear for the rest of your days uh, after watching this film. But I found myself smitten with the visuals of this film. I was in awe the entire time at being like, oh my God, that is like the most beautiful shot ever. And then the next, and then it cuts, and there's another shot that's like, it's just a shot, it's coverage, but they're both beautiful. And I'm like, oh my Lord. And they're filming in these locations and you can you can just tell, you can look in the background and the way that the camera moves and the background moves also perfectly also, you're like, yeah, they're really filming in the Austrian Alps and you can just like every single shot there's no compromises visually in this film um and I I I quite like that I like the story too it's cute um I have yet to decide on my thoughts on the last section I think we 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 could tease those out as we talk about it um I think that it's an interesting thing to include in the film it's sort of foreshadowed but it is like tacked on for 30 minutes at the end so I don't quite know what to think about that um 
And yeah, what else do I have to say at the beginning of this film? I like, you know, I, I like the songs and the score quite a, quite a lot too. They were in my head. Um, and pretty much all of them were recognizable. It was I never was taken by surprise by the songs there. So that speaks to the staying power and the, just the cultural power of this movie in that me, not a musical lover, had heard all of these songs before um, sitting down to watch it. Yeah, it's definitely a movie that, that feels ubiquitous, even if you haven't seen it, as you said, because these songs have been parodied. They have been they've been played to death. Um, my mom is constantly singing them. So even though I haven't seen this movie in 15 years of my life, I, I was probably in elementary school the last time I saw this. Uh, I still remember most of them and, and their lyrics and their melodies and even like the situation that they take place in in the movie um, because the movie is just that prevalent. Um, and, and it's a movie that I didn't have a lot of reverence for um, personally because I'm not a huge musical fan. And, and we've talked about that as we watched West Side Story and as we watched My Fair Lady. There are a few that stick out to me, um, but on the whole, the musical genre doesn't really appeal to me because it's just it's overly earnest i find some of the things a little bit cheesy um and this movie is the ultimate example of that but it actually comes full circle and ends up working because i think why why this movie works for me as a musical is music is integral to this story and to this this family and the characters in a way that it doesn't feel like musical numbers are just inserted because the characters are randomly singing for whatever reason, who knows? But no, uh, Maria loves to sing. And when she's singing, usually in the canon of the film, she's actually singing. And she's teaching these these kids to have fun and sing and dance. And you can sort of see them, you can see the music transform them over the course of the film. So even though there are a few numbers that I'll get to that I thought that were like mind-numbingly obnoxious to me. Because <laughs> while I like the kids and I like the concept, I don't think most of them are, are great, frankly. I think they're a little annoying. Um, but... Maria is such an endearing main character, and those visuals are so fantastic uh, that I do end up really liking this film, though I think it could be changed in some ways that make it hit home a lot better for me, because this film is surprisingly simple. It is very simple, but it's also three hours long, and it's that those two feel very much at odds with each other, because not a, not a lot changes for that first two and a half hours. You know, there's a couple of plot points, but we're just, we're kind of just existing with this family for over the runtime of your average film. And I think that that is a detriment to me because we don't end up getting super fleshed out and really in the psyche of these characters. No, they're just they're just having fun. Uh, and, and there's a value to that, but as a Best Picture winner, I do think that there could have been more character development. There could have been more uh, themes as it ties into the end of the film that do make this feel, film not the ultimate thing that it could be, but still, it is one of the greats, and I really did enjoy it. The Sound of Music is a uh, it's, it's a sugary sweet experience. And luckily yeah. for this film, I have a bit of a sweet tooth. Uh, <laughs> I I really loved the, watching The Sound of Music. I I watched it like again in like middle school or something like that over the course of a week in music class or something like that. Uh, so didn't really remember much outside of like the obvious big uh, musical sequences. But no, this movie is funny, it is beautiful. It is overly long, I will admit, but I was in I was in for it for basically the entire ride. There's a point uh, immediately after the intermission where I think you really feel the drag, um, yes. but we can interrogate that later. But yeah, Julie Andrews is fantastic. Her physicality, her singing, obviously, but also her just regular like film acting is really impressive. This being her second feature film, I believe. Uh, after Mary Poppins, which was only the year before and hadn't even come out by the time this movie came out, but was being filmed. Um, I also love Christopher Plummer. Uh, I, I don't think he's as good as Julie Andrews, but as this sort of like uh, stick up his butt sort of military guy, I think he's he, he, he is having a good time. And some interesting um, behind the scenes trivia about his feelings Ooh, about the early film trivia. Uh, I'll get into. Ooh. Yes. I um, like a I little... Also, foreshadow for some trivia i like the kids um it, for like 60s child actors i think they're probably about the best you can get and I, I i liked a lot of the scenes that they were included in so yes very much a fan of the sound of music what was the trivia bit oh uh well i'll just i'll just preface this i have more specifics later um but christopher Plummer is infamous for hating this movie hating filming it, hating the positivity, like the sugary sweetness of it all. He was very much like, I absolutely despise this. Uh, I believe he compared working with Julie Andrews every, every day, like 
to being, quote, hit over the head with a Valentine's Day card. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wouldn't hurt too much, so, you know, that's no, not that bad. <laughs> not that bad. But, yeah, no, he, he hated this. He was uh, constantly uh, drunk, uh, apparently, during filming for a lot of this, <laughs> just because he despised the experience. <laughs> very interesting. Yeah. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't really come across in his acting, which I think is very interesting, because you, you hear about some of these, but it proves that he's a great actor when he can just push that aside, and he, he does have that very rigid militaristic quality at the beginning obviously intended so but mm -hmm. by the end of the film he is a much more relaxed guy and godspeed christopher Plummer. Uh, also rest in peace he's, yeah. he's no longer alive um but uh you know you did the best you could yeah and, and, it, and it paid off he, he's good in this movie yeah um but i think we should start with talking about uh maria julie andrews i i think she's absolutely fantastic in this as i said earlier i mean I think it really starts, you get a sense of her comedic chops and her physicality and her acting just in like the first, I don't know, probably 20 minutes of this. Because the beginning of this movie does move quite fast. You get obviously the classic opening of her being on top of the mountain, spinning around, singing, this is, the hills are alive with the sound of music. The da, 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 da. hills are alive. Not, not then, only that, but with the craziest... Like, yes. Uh, panning in shot of the of the Alps, and she's there, and it just mm -hmm. the camera keeps going, and then boom, you're into that scene, and that transition coming out of the opening credits, which are insanely elegant and beautiful shots of of Austrian the Austrian environment, mm -hmm. and then just pulling in, it's like, oh no, we're right into this, and and who knows how smoothly they did that, but it it really paid off. Mm -hmm. It's a great intersection of the of the direction and cinematography and also Julie Andrews' presence because that is like one of the film images of all time is Julie Andrews spinning around with her arms out on top of that mountain and you know yeah. it, it's equally it's it's a, it's a variance of, of of contributions that makes that so so iconic for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that opening, the way we open, and then we go right into the church, and we go right into the convent, and to see that scene, I didn't initially know it was really going on there, but I, as, after I figured it out, um, I, I quite like that scene, and the way that the film goes from this big, like, orchestral opening, I'm thinking in terms of music here, once, so we start at the, the with the, the hills are alive with the sound of music, and it's the swelling strings, and then we come out of that, and we're in the church, and it's just like the singing of the choir, um, yeah. and I, I like that from just a, the, those are kind of very different sounds, and to put them right back to back to, to each other, and I like that the way it moves us forward plot-wise, um, yeah. in that sequence with the, with, in the convent with all the nuns, and how we don't waste a lot of time. Um, we have a little. We have a musical sequence because we have a musical sequence with every new setting. It's a musical. Mm -hmm. I mean, what? That, you can't say anything about that. Yeah. But as we are quickly moving Maria to going to the Von Trapp house and quickly going to have her yes. um, on her arc right off of, off the bat at the beginning, and for more time for us to just hang out with the family Von Trapp, which Tucker you had a little issue with. I don't really have an issue with because I like I like seeing them hang out together. They're fun and. Uh, I guess it satisfies my sweet tooth because it is very <laughs> saturin <laughs> in those yeah, sects, yeah. I, I would say. Saturin, I wanna actually, that's the right word. I want to stop us before I even get into the household because in that first number with the nuns, it became it becomes apparent that the, there is not a whole hell of a lot of choreography or camera work in the musical sequences. Yeah. And at first, I didn't know if this was going to really take me out of the film. But I think, if anything, it speaks kind of to what you're saying, Tucker, wherein the musical numbers really aren't that divorced from reality yeah. uh, as yeah, sequences yeah. are unfolding. So there's this sort of, like, earnest quality to the fact that they're, they're quite plain in the choreography, and a lot of the choreography, if it is there, is happening in, in the actual narrative, like the farewell uh, adieu song as they're actually dancing and walking up the stairs, they're off to, to make their escape at the end of the film. That's sort of where the choreography begins and ends. And I don't know if it's a negative towards the film for me on the whole, because when I think about the most successful musicals, the musicals I love the most, your, your Chicago's, your La La Land's, there's something qu quite amazing about the spectacle of, of dance, but obviously the musical numbers in films like those are very much uh, dreamlike or removed for one reason or another from the core narrative. I think what keeps it these sequences... It would be insane if some of that stuff was actually yeah. happening. <laughs> yeah. I, I think what keeps the sequences compelling for me, and we've, we've said it before, is just how goddamn catchy the songs are mm -hmm. i i yeah. think you know i think to like 
an American in Paris or something, right? And I think there's some there's some fun visual humor and, and, and choreography in those dance sequences, but I could not tell you a single song they sung, right? And and I think that this film is is going to endure in my mind, having seen it now, those numbers because of the writing and how well performed they are. To the point where for me at least it compensates for the large lack of choreography across the film. Yeah, that's, that's definitely Rogers something... and Hammerstein on the beat, you know what I mean? They mm-hmm. they got those earworms. They do. That's something that I definitely noticed at first, and and I I'm in, I'm in the same boat as you because I was I was ready for it to get annoying. When you see, I, I actually think that that first one with the nuns, um, talking about how Maria is either good or bad depending on their perspective, and like they're arguing about the same thing, but just like different sides. I think that's one of my least favorite scenes in the film because I don't find those nuns particularly compelling, and it's a interesting way to set up Maria's character as like kind of the 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 tomboy who's not really at home uh, in the convent. Uh, but I, I I think I would have preferred more learning about her as a person rather than just hearing through the words of the nuns. And also, it is mo- one of the most static sequences in terms of musical sequences in the film. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's also not particularly compelling visually in terms of it's like it's just them wearing their black and white and there's a gray wall behind them. It's like, all right, it's a little bit flat. But that's very much in the minority of the musical numbers in this because... Once we do get the addition of her whole band of merry misfits that jump around with her for the rest of the film, there's a lot more dynamicism in the film. And we do get a few sequences that are choreographed going off of stairs or benches and things like that. And and that adds a lot more flavor. But you're right, Abram, that the fact that these characters just actually enjoy dancing and this is actually happening, at least for the most part, there might be somewhere you might be like, oh, I can't, can't really tell if this is really happening or not, but... That kept me grounded in the reality uh, in a way that I don't think I've ever been in a musical before because I, I tend to really like when they're super over the top and things are going crazy in the background and you, you've, you've got a huge set with all these extras. This is, this is a lot simpler, but again, it takes it a whole 180 to where I probably wouldn't like this in, in most other musicals, but it works here. Yeah, I, I honestly don't think um, the, the sort of... Uh... Static, static, stoicism. static nature. Static nature. That also yeah. works. Of the how do you solve a problem like Maria or the entire sequences, the the sequences in the convent are that bad because a they're also beautifully shot. I mean the stuff when you cut to uh like the actual the abbey itself and we there's the stained glass windows and all the nuns lined up singing and stuff like that. I think that's equally as well shot and beautiful as the wide open nature shots we just got. I I say that as a lover of wide open nature nature shots. But also, like, you're not going to have the nuns, like, singing around and dancing and clicking their heels together uh, doing their musical sequences. Yeah. They um, are nuns. But they are nuns, of course. Uh, and I think they it also serves... have none of that. Yeah. <laughs> I think it Thank also you. serves to elite. sort of juxtapose where Maria feels happy and comfortable being on top of that mountain spinning around versus where she's lived her entire adult life and her childhood, which is in this dark concrete stone like it be- immediately becomes like overcast when she goes there as well uh uh this convent this abbey and um i think it's interesting that you know that sort of uh visually signifies the how she's sort of stifled there and that's what the um the main nun i forget what her name is she recognizes that she's like maria you're just Mother like abbess ma- i believe ma- yeah you're just not meant to be here and I-, I i understand that you like think that you are but this is just not the place for you and it's it's hard for you to understand that because this is the only place you've ever known and that's why i'm sending you off to live with the von traps and get a little taste of life in you a little bit um but no i i I think that the that this first 20 minutes is is really strong and moves at quite a clip for a three-hour movie Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. the pace of it's really interesting i i think to consider and i think this is maybe why i feel that the film sags a little bit in the middle Mm -hmm. in terms of pacing because we get when we get to the von trap household we get that great scene of, of the whistle blowing and lining everybody up. Mm-hmm. And we we very quickly move from this incredibly antagonistic relationship between everybody to the sequence in the bedroom after we have, after shithead Rolf is introduced. And we'll talk about him later. Yeah. But in the, in the matter of a couple of scenes, we not only set up all the character relationships, but we very quickly have the kids warming up to Maria to yeah. the point where... It almost felt to me going into the film of, okay, we're going to spend the first act with her trying to confront the kids and break down these walls and everything. 
but we don't. Instead, it's sort of a, we arrive at the Von Trapp household. We, they play a couple practical jokes. They put a frog in her pocket. They put a pine cone on the chair. Classics. Very, <laughs> classics. <laughs> Always classic <laughs> jokes. We all do them. But then we uh, we end up in um, the, the, the bedroom sequence where Liesl comes through the window, and quickly they become friends, and then mm-hmm. quickly, immediately Liesl's like, well, actually, I do need a governess. And then all of the kids are scared, so they run in, mm-hmm. and they sing a song together, and they're all friends. And even the relationship, the antagonistic relationship with the captain ends up fading away because he goes he goes off to to go to Vienna. And by the time he's back, it feels like, okay, the status quo has been established. And I just, yeah. I thought it would take longer to get those character relationships to that point. And because I don't, I think, Tucker, to your point from earlier, that's when it feels like we're just kind of vibing with the family for a little while. Yeah. And that, to me, is where the film starts to lose some of that momentum from those first 20 minutes. Um, it, it, the film okay. tries to have its main uh, length of time be that there's not a huge amount of conflict in terms of our core cast of characters. There is the there is in this section this, the side character of of Gerard von Trapp who is who's not present as much, and the whole thing with the Baroness, which as you said, I, I think is a little bit weaker. Um, but is just that uh, Maria is teaching these kids to have fun for the first time in their life, and and that is. The development that is what is changing over the course of the next 45 50 hour hour 10 hour 15 who knows how long it goes on but the main chunk of the film is just them being like yeah we can have fun and oh this is how singing works uh, immediately having incredible pitch and and timing and <laughs> and boom ah, off that. it's a but, musical <laughs> i know i know i'm yeah i josh but yeah, uh, they yeah. hadn't even they hadn't even heard songs before no <laughs> they had you you missed there's the plot point that he he yeah. forbade the, the captain forbade no no, no i i yeah. remember that but because friedrich or one of them says songs i don't know any songs never heard any songs <laughs> which is like hey you guys know what songs you want to sing um but i i think for me that is Fun, but maybe not fun for the amount of time that it's drawn over. I, is is my main point about the pacing. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I would say that I kind of like the dynamic that's set up by. This is a thing that I think about in that some we are all very concerned about story and about having our 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 good conflict, which creates good narrative, a good plot. But I think some people don't really like a whole lot of conflict in their movies, and especially in a film like this, where it is so sweet and nice for the majority of it, to solve the conflict easily and at the beginning then allows us to explore the relationships between um, what's it between Maria oh, yeah. and all the children um, mm-hmm. in in a in a way where later it's it able to be paid off where she basically goes one by one and tells Georg hey here's how you're screwing up your children by you're not giving your son enough love. You don't. You don't even realize how old your daughter is. You, your your little tiny children just want you to notice them. Like she goes through and bing 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 lists off why. Seven sins. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Father yeah. sins. Ding. <laughs> yeah. Um, and she, so I think that that's the choice that the film makes is to not. <laughs> you guys are father sins. <laughs> Sorry, Timo, continue. The, the film makes the choice to kind of backseat, to put the conflict on the backseat and instead focus on the musical aspect, focus on the numbers, use the Rodgers and Hammerstein score and lyrics to propel us forward and to have... I, what are the sequences of the musical sequences that we get during this... Between when the captain leaves and comes back, we've got. Uh, I well, guess yeah, there, we'll count the thunderstorm sequence with. Yeah, um, my favorite things is my, right before is like the night before he leaves, mm-hmm. and there's, then there's it's Do a deer Do Re Mi. Do Re Mi. Yeah. Is there anything else? Uh, no, I mean the, the the rest of that song it it is done through montage, which is why I really don't feel the drag that you mm-hmm. guys are saying uh, you yeah. guys feel here is that it's done through montage, and yes, you have the initial Do Re Mi song, and then you have sort of like complications or reprises of that over the montage of them like skipping along rivers and going to markets and yeah. you know coming out in their all their matching leader hose and then dresses and stuff like that made out of the um, drapes yes and I, I it's you know it's her teaching them to sing it's them you know growing to get get to know each other and her knowing them and the kids having fun for like the first time in years I think it all I think it all works together in that sort of that saccharine sugary sweet way where and it's all backgrounded by, you know, a reprise of a quite a catchy song. So yes, I, I very much enjoy that and then it is obviously uh cut off by when uh 
Captain Von Trapp returns with Uncle Max and the Baroness, and he, mm -hmm. he sees them. The local urchins climbing the trees and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and I will I, say I think just you. quickly, Abram, that yeah, is where I think the it. film drives. The the film mm -hmm. drags after the return of the captain. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, I I can I consider that as part of the same area oh, because okay. I think it it that ends that starts when he or when, I guess when the, in the bedroom sort of and it ends at inter intermission, but also kind of a little bit. After that, or I, I don't know, but it is it is most of the film, and I and I do include after he comes back in that in that section. Yeah, to to be more precise, but where I think it drags, I agree. It's once he it's once he returns. I my only problem with that Do Re Mi section is that that version of Do Re Mi is not as good as Black Bear's song Do Re Mi, which I much prefer. <laughs> I see. <laughs> but but sort of my my problem is when he comes back and we bring the Baroness into the picture. That mm -hmm. to me is when it feels like oh we we went really quickly through the development of of the relationship between Maria and the kids. So now we need to throw some other new wrench into the mix, right? Because it's not it's not even that it's not even that Maria talks to Georg and he's like, No way and no way in hell are you right about this. Yeah, I know how to raise my kids, you don't. The conflict ends up becoming it's it's that for like half of a scene until he hears, What is that? Is that singing for my children? Yeah, yeah. And then it, boom on a dime. Mm -hmm. Right. And and that and that's not even necessarily what bothers me either. What, what I, what I said when I meant like these relationships have got to that point of status quo very fast is basically that moment. What it becomes then is how can we kill some time? Well, the Baroness, who gets very little development, has very little reason to be here other than like they are in a relationship and she's from Vienna or whatever. She has to come in and on another dime convince Maria that she's not wanted and yeah. then it just feels like there's an unnecessary hurdle because I think that if you if you just did a little bit of a and I'm in I'm in a I'm in an introductory level screenwriting class so I know better than whoever wrote this movie <laughs> if you just if you just clipped out that section and I think you got faster into the um, the beginning of World War II you could have spent more time with that core cast of characters I just think that the that the Baroness is just this unnecessary complication to create artificial tension when I think there could have been far more organically teased out tension from the core Von Trapp family. See, I yeah. don't necessarily agree that it's like artificial tension because the the moment where the Baroness essentially kicks Maria out and then she goes yeah. away and has her moment of reckoning and what does she realize when she's away? She's it, it becomes this like like that's where our romance of the film comes in. It's because it's the conf the competition yeah. for the captain between Maria and the Baroness is this is this the new I would say our central dynamic and our central line of tension in the film in this section is that part. And so I would argue that because I think that the film is like just slower in this part. I don't think it's because of the plot that's happening that I'm like felt bored i remember like laying there on my couch and being like i'm kind of bored right now while i was watching it i said that out loud to myself but the the conflict that is being you know complicated built up and expanded upon and then resolved of maria realizing she's in love having to fight against the baroness for the love of the captain and then succeeding in getting his love at the end when the when the it, the engagement is called off that is i i would say kind of like our our narrative capsule of this second half ish yeah. of the movie and then the third half is the we're start of world war one well, kind two. of that's that two true also world war two yeah uh oh yeah oh, here we <laughs> but, are in the 30s that's my yeah. favorite that's my favorite 1900s decade by the way is the 30s right. yeah. <laughs> Uh, the the reason that I think I uh, don't quite connect to this second section, while I do really like her teaching the kids how to have fun, Abram, sorry, it does feel like the status quo gets established very quickly. Um, but it, I, frankly, I don't find the romance between Maria and, and old Captain Georg von Trapp to be particularly compelling. Like, I really don't feel like they have that great of chemistry. And I don't feel like it's hinted at enough that she's into him before she has that breakdown and, and, and runs away back to the Abbey. It, 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 it felt to me like that was really uh, the, the Baroness saying, hey, you're in love with him. And she's like, oh, shit, really? Uh, and then she ran away. Like, of course, there was the moment before where she blushed, but I more interpreted that of, oh, she's embarrassed that she's dancing with with uh, the captain and the guy that, she, or the, the, the woman that she's about to marry is right there. Like, oh, that's an awkward social situation. But... That, for me, is really one of the only moments where I feel like there could be inference that she liked him before that. So not having it very well established and then 
pretty much as soon as she comes back, they they both realize they love each other and they have that kiss uh, with, framed in the door and then boom, everyone's happy. Like it, it is a very, uh, very simple romance that for me didn't feel like there was enough uh, development. Like I didn't feel like she was growing to like him. It was just like, oh, no, I'm, oh she realized she liked him and that wasn't very satisfying for me. Um, I, I have a few things to address here. Okay, so a, a number of things. Um, okay. To address the the bitterness point, I am led to believe that she is a more fleshed out character in the stage musical. Uh, you get a better sense of like, I believe in the stage musical she is a like Nazi supporter insofar as like she understands it's going to happen and she doesn't really care what happens to everybody else as long as she gets hers. So yeah, I feel like that's kind of implied through her like just like oh you know money is the only thing that matters and like not worrying about the war because she's such an upper class person yeah um but to talk about the romance between uh maria and georg um i think it's sort of um i think there are little like fun little nuggets that are placed uh throughout their their interactions in the first part of the film i mean starting out with with her like immediately pushing back on the whole like whistle thing she's like i'm not gonna do that that's silly i feel like that that's that is the sort of beginnings of these of these things of him being like no one's ever like told me not to do this before who does she mm -hmm. think she is oh but I'm, I'm sort of intrigued by this whole sort of thing and of course you have these sort of uh if i may interpret a bit of romantic and maybe even sexual tension when uh he accidentally calls her captain uh which is a very fun moment when that when they're arguing about you know i know how to parent my kids captain uh which apparently it was an actual um mistake that christopher Plummer made on set hmm. and they just decided to keep it in probably because uh, he was so, drunk <laughs> probably because he was drunk actually yeah <laughs> um but yeah they, they they decided to keep it in and i think that it, that huh. is placed throughout um i especially think it, it, it comes to a head especially when uh he sort of cuts in and dances with maria to that austrian sort of folk dance i think that's a, that's a good like blossoming romantic scene where it really comes into maria's mind that she's like oh I am in love with this guy. How embarrassing that I'm realizing this. I'm dancing with this guy who's about to marry the Baroness. X, Y, and Z. Tucker, I think you have a point there. Um, but yeah, I, I think that, that the romance was uh, well planted throughout. And I'm not in love with their chemistry. I think their chemistry is fine. Um, but I think it is just ultimately that I like seeing these two charismatic actors who are sort of opposite to track sort of thing get together just because it's, it's fun and intriguing. I mean, I, I think the thing about it is like... I've seen a movie before, so <laughs> when uh -huh. she when she arrives at the at the Von Trapp house, I'm like, okay, yeah, they're gonna they're gonna be kissing by the time the the, the credits roll, right? Mm -hmm. And this is this is not really actually they're fleeing from the Nazis around that time. But... <laughs> Great point. <laughs> uh -huh. This isn't really a narrative with a lot of like friction in it. Yeah. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's 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 smooth sailing for the most part. So I agree that. I think that that scene of them dancing is is quite intimate and nice. I, I like I like it filmed them and in, in the dancing in front of the kids in the yard here and those close ups of their face and sort of the smile on his and everything. I, I think that's really all I needed to communicate that relationship. I what what it just comes down to me on is like what, when the Baroness confronts her when they're getting getting ready for the party. I I get it. She the Baroness is a snake, right? But it's obviously something that's going to be a sort of resolved very quickly. It, it is not a film that really takes its time to really chew on any conflict, even in that last thirty minute sequence w with uh with the captain being recruited to the to the Nazi um w boat army navy. Uh, <laughs> the boat yeah, army. No. I like boat army. Um, like that's that also is resolved quite quickly. Also, so mm -hmm. my feeling was. It just felt like with with the Baroness plot point, we need something to to pump the brakes a little bit. And how do we pump the brakes? We send Maria back to the convent. And I get your mm -hmm. point, Timo, about you know it gives her an opportunity to sort of reconcile her own perspective and her own desire and who she is. But I I just think you could do that in a, in a way that doesn't involve what feels like an, a a plot hurdle to have a plot hurdle to keep us moving forward. I think it's also because at that point in the narrative, I'm like, goddamn, we're like two hours in. And yeah. we got to keep trucking along. And it just uh -huh. feels like time for another thing to happen. It's interesting that you say that because as we've been talking about each of these points, we've pretty much gone through the movie chronologically, which I think is right. impressive and unique for a Quest episode, mm -hmm. uh, is that a lot of things happen in this movie. And every time we say one of these things happen, we're like, oh, that happened real quickly. Oh, and oh, man, oh, that was resolved. Bam. 
And it's not that the film doesn't have a lot happen, but I feel like each thing has, each scene is just long in itself. Like it feels like it's moving at a, at a quick pace, but that's because so many things are happening, but there's a lot of, like physically, there's actually a lot of time. Like each scene is is a full 15 minute thing, which is, you know, a, a five minute or seven minute in, in any other film, which is how you end up with a film that's almost twice the length of your average movie. Uh, and, and I think that that maybe is why I feel the film dragged is not because these things aren't happening and don't feel like they're happening. Oh, that was quick in the world of the movie, but is that we are actually sitting with them for a lot longer than your average film. Uh, and I do feel like within each sequence, not necessarily cutting any any conflict or any set of scene or any like scene idea, cutting within a scene to make them happen a little bit faster, I think would resolve my uh, my problems with, with it dragging a little bit in the middle. I'm just thinking to the scene where the captain comes back. Um, that is a really long scene there. If you're going to count like plot points that I, there's like four plot points in one scene. I think I think yeah. your point stands, Tucker, that the scenes are quite long. But yeah. what I, I will just push back on this just once because I kind of already talked about it. But we don't think about our audience very much when we do quest. I think this film is very conscious of who it's being made for and who is going to watch it. It is yeah. a musical. It is about children. It is, you know, there is a little bit of conflict in it, but not much. It is designed for, I think, a much wider audience, a certainly not a very like into a very casual film watching audience, not people yes. who are used to be seeing stuff with heightened amounts of tension and conflict and stakes. This film takes like the opposite perspective to creating a narrative that is worth watching in making it full of the musical elements and making having these like generally likable characters that we want to hang out with instead of being conflict driven. I'm going to maintain yeah. that this film is really not driven by its conflict. And that's just an incidental thing. And then they just also because of the time period tacked on our World War II conflict at the end. I don't know if it's tacked on or not yet. I, I, can we talk about the end? Can sure. we do it? Is it is sure. it? Is, do you feel like that end is just added? Really, or the only is thing you skipped like, over was the marriage. Which, yeah, yeah, you know, it's uh, fine. It's well shot. Oh, it's beautiful. It's, that it is so, that, and that dress when we tilt the camera up, it's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Quickly thing, now, I know we were all talking over each other on the wedding because <laughs> I have trivia. I love the scene, as Abram said, beautifully shot. Uh, I like the uh, problem like Maria reprise uh, over that while she's walking down the aisle. Love Doesn't make that. a lot of sense, but fu it's a it's reprise funny, about her. It's a, it's, no. it's her oh, character. No, no, but so. are they yeah. singing it? At her wedding, I, saying that she's oh, a problem oh, oh. and saying that oh, uh, maybe anyway, we don't like her that much. Is, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, the trivia is that um, apparently whoever was in charge of like doing the the casting call for that day forgot to tell the actor who is playing the bishop. Um, so they actually used the bishop of that church in that scene. Oh, huh. cool. Yeah, sure. Uh, let me. He's let on me... screen for what? A total of ten seconds, maybe. <laughs> That's just for interesting. It is interesting. Tanner, I appreciate you. Thank you. I just want to put it out there. Here's what I want to say, Timo. Because I've, I've been doing a lot of criticism on sort of like the bones of the film. But nonetheless, as I said, I did enjoy it quite a bit. And I think it comes from the fact that although the film is frictionless, I think you're right that it's intentionally so, Timo. And it is just fun seeing little Gretel like like drop a tomato when she's trying to juggle her or stuff like this. Like uh -huh. the there's a certain, like, hair-tossling charm to this movie of, ooh, kids are doing cute stuff, and everybody's laughing, and we're doing little marionette numbers and all of that. It is, it is endearing, and I think endearing is a great word for that, that long stretch of highway driving of we're just being a family together. And, and I think what became effective about those last 30 minutes for me, Timo, is that we, the, we switch that, we flip that switch off, right? It's no longer fun. It's no, we're, we're on the precipice of the family being together is the unit they want to be but no you got, you got to go off to war you got to go fight for the nazis and and i think that introducing the this this tension as the film is wrapping up after we've become comfortable and happy for our characters is quite effective and this feeling of you know the captain is is such a a, a dour fool as the movie begins and we see him light up and now it's about to be all taken away from him even though it, it yeah we we see you know we 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 get that one um we get we get the Rolf Hiles him earlier in the film and we get a little bit mm -hmm. of this tension about like the politics and everything but it's not it it it's not really clear what's going to happen until it does and I think that's effective 
in a film that takes so long to, to deliberately circumvent its own tension. To say all of a sudden, look, you're at the finish line, but you can't quite have it. You can't quite have that family unit. And so I think that invested me as an audience member who was maybe on my phone for maybe 10 minutes prior to that last 30 minutes of saying, oh, shit, I got to be dialed in now because this family, this status quo that I have been sitting with is about to be upended and I don't want that to happen. Abram looking up at his phone, are those swastikas? What's going on? <laughs> well, the interesting thing <laughs> the about Nazis this film are here. is when it, did plays, that it plays so coy with the World War II, beginning of World War II presence for the vast majority of its runtime. And Tanner and I were sitting there, you know, watching the movie, and we're imagining mm-hmm. a world in which you didn't know that this movie was going to involve the Nazis at all. And you're standing there, oh, there's a silly little, this silly little uh, messenger boy comes up. He's throwing rocks at the window. And, and, and then he just seek hails, and it's like, whoa, hold the, hold the fuck. And then they just drop that for like an hour and a half. And it's like, oh, I, I guess the Nazis are, are a thing. And I, I think I agree with you, Abram, that in terms of sort of a bittersweet, like, uh, not release of tension, but like gaining of tension at the end. It's effective. Um, but I think the reason that I I don't love the ending is because I wish that it had been given more time in the film. Is after the uh, after the intermission, we have very few things. We ha- we have getting her back from the abbey to the trap to, to the trap house, uh, and then the marriage, <laughs> her married, and then yeah, and then like literally cut hard cut to. Oh, they're gone. They're they're doing their uh, they're doing their honeymoon, mm. and then oh, we have the Nazi conflict like ten seconds later. And I I think that having it hard shift so quickly into that from lavish wedding to uh to, to the the Nazi conflict um to me feels like there's there's something missing in there. Is is having this build a little bit better? Getting to know a little more about why um why Georg. Is, does not want to be involved with this, learning a little bit more about how the how Austrian culture is being taken over um, by the Nazis in, invading and taking over the government. I feel like that would have led the uh, ending to have more naturally built tension because as it stands, uh, we just watch them sing and then they're they're off to the hill. Well, and there's a thing where they're like hiding behind the stone in the graveyard. Um, but... To me, it just didn't feel like it was it was built up to naturally enough. So like, I like it conceptually, but as I'm watching it, I'm like, I I feel like I could be, could be more invested in this. Um, if I were to play defense for this for for this decision, and you I can't. do I do I do agree that it happened it does happen suddenly. Uh, but if I were to play defense for it, I would say that the, the Anschluss, as they are depicting in this, did happen quite suddenly. Sure. Uh, the, the, yeah, it, well, it, it again, was. So did Pearl Harbor and From Here to Eternity. Yeah. But <laughs> I don't remember that movie. Uh, we're talking about this one. <laughs> That's a Fred Zinnemann movie. Uh huh. We just did one of those last week. We're not oh, on yeah. that anymore. <laughs> uh-huh. I could draw points of difference, but I'm not going to because um, I, I it did it does happen. Qu- it did happen quite uh, quite immediately uh, for for the people there, and uh, I think. That you know the, the the last section of this film is quite captivating in the this new conflict that is that that is introduced, and I don't think it's uh, it might not be like seen all the way through. Maybe uh, as I maybe see your complaint being there is that because the von Trapps knew that like we got to get out while we can, and apparently like the the real family, the real von Trapp family did like uh cross the border the austrian border the day before the germans closed the borders so that i mean i I think that is this thing of like they need to get out while they can they understand you know this 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 uh the nazi invasion is coming and you know we then we have like the nazi officers and everything like that introducing an interesting conflict when they're like waiting for them outside the house because they know they're gonna try to escape, and they force that, or they sort of, they, uh, Maria sort of tricks them into letting them go to um, this performance and stuff like that. So I did find this this last thirty minutes, if sudden, to be quite encapsulating. Mm-hmm. In the canon of real life, it all happens suddenly. So therefore, in the film, mm, I don't know. I love. Uh, that's your. I'm just. I'm just succinctifying your argument. <laughs> Thank Tucker, you. if you did that, we would have ten minute episodes, and then no one would watch yes! the show. Um, I think I want to straddle the position between, um, between Abram and Tucker. I think Abram's point about the film, like it re-raises stakes. I think we don't have a lot of stakes for, for most of the film. 
What happens if these characters fail? Like, realistically, not much. But now, we have a lot that happens if they fail. We really don't yeah. want them. And we we take the, the, the basis for which everything on the film has been built up before, which is the singing, the song, and the dance. And that is our central component to the... Uh, to their escape plan, um, which to go sing and then as as, as they wave goodbye, as they wave, oh, feed his hand to actually like GTFO. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that the film takes its stakes, it raises them, but it doesn't go too far. The film doesn't try to ter- suddenly turn into an action yeah. movie and to turn into Do something, something it's not. that it isn't. It's still this like somewhat children's movie the yeah. like it still takes a light-handed approach to the conflict even though it feels very real and it feels like yeah like like a like abram and tanner saying like oh my god i gotta pay attention to this there's swastikas all over the place it's an important scene i think because of the context and we we understand the the danger through our, our our previous knowledge that every single human has basically um and not because of the film's like re the film does a little re re uh, creation of suspense and, and stakes and whatnot, but I think it doesn't actually do that much. It's just that the situation changes and we change our interpretation as a result. I would I would say also that much like uh, Tatooine Rhapsody, I think there's something nice about music being used to sort of solve this major problem as as we reach the conclusion of the film, because. Obviously, music is very important to the movie, as the title mm-hmm. might suggest, or most of the runtime might suggest. But I, I like the um, I like the power of that being how they get out of danger. Ultimately, yeah. this big family number to then escape out off backstage and then make their way to the abbey. It is it is certainly very, very family, very wacky little adventure to get to get away from this hyper dangerous situation but i i think it, it tracks nicely with the tone of the film it tracks nicely with the strengths of the characters this idea that suddenly this big performance that the captain didn't want to do didn't want to silly to partake in is the thing that saved them is nice and i think that it just ties things up quite well it it, it, it circles back to these numbers that we like it circles back to the, the, the captain overcoming this this frankly somewhat unexplained disinterest in singing in public but I, I think it something is to do with his dead wife. I think yeah, everything you, you about can, him and his weirdness is uh, like, yeah, oh, it's his dead wife. <laughs> but then there's also just you know, I also like the moment of the um, of the nuns in the abbey saying, uh, we, we, "Sister, we we've or, we've oh sinned." God, that's funny. And then they pull yeah, out good. the car. And then parts. Sons, they're mechanics, and they're like, "Hey, we ripped something down." <laughs> yeah, it's it's <laughs> yeah. That part. Tucker, Tucker, to your point, it's it's you know, it's it's not fully, it's not thought all the way through. It's no. not hyper developed, but. Doesn't need it, to be. it is a raising of the stakes in the context of sort of the tone and progression of this movie. And it yeah. brings back nice things and it makes it makes you feel good. And my favorite movies make you feel bad. So every once <laughs> in a while it's nice to watch the sound of music, I think. So I just can't be too mad at the ending. And you get another, um, you get like another nice, like the film ends with the awesome helicopter shot of them, like all in their their back. crazy later hose and like walking up the hill and like it's beautiful. It's a yeah that it, so it ends it bookends with these the hills, and the music. They are alive with the sound of music. Um, I have a few other things. I it, it's speaking of that speaking to that that final sequence and bringing things back like Abram said, uh, it it brings back in quite a nice way. Uh, Captain Von Trapp singing Edelweiss, mm-hmm. uh, which is probably which is yeah. an underwhelming musical sequence when it happens in the first half of the film, but of course when it happens uh, at the end, it is like him pouring his heart out, speaking to the human spirit of the people of Austria. Sort of. Yeah, asking. but it's also somewhat like the uh, Casablanca scene. It is a a national uh, yeah, exactly. identity song, Ooh. and while I don't like. That song, like I, 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 it's not one of my favorites. It lacks a lot of energy. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it lacks an energy. But in terms of a, uh, in terms of a, the concept of him pushing back in, against the Nazi regime by using music, something that the Nazis have said multiple times that no, we still want music. Everything's normal in Austria, mm-hmm. and he's like. Yeah, but I can. I know you don't want me to sing something that makes the local people of Austria very proud to be Austrians and not part of the Nazi regime, and then everyone starts singing along with him. It's a lot like that scene you like so much in Casablanca, yes. um, where they start singing the, the national anthem. 
Tucker, I, I drew that connection when I was watching the movie, and I'm glad you brought it up because that's a fantastic point. Thank you. Uh, and and I, I I love I, I that's why you know I like both you of those sequences. You have self congratulatory episodes of class. Like you know what that was awesome. Great yeah. job. Pat on the back. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. What else? I I I I feel like we're winding down a little bit. We know mm-hmm. we we've reached the end of the movie as we go <laughs> through it chronologically. Yeah. So um uh some other things. Oh we didn't we didn't talk about the sixteen going on seventeen sequence, but I like that. Oh uh, yeah. It was fun to start. Tucker and I were joking because of course in these old Hollywood movies. You know, uh, age inappropriate relationships are the norm, and Rolf looks like he could be like twenty eight or whatever. So he's like, wait, when he says, "I am seventeen, going on 18 we're like, "Whoa, oh my god!" <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. My, that's but exactly. Trivia. Trivia to that point, uh, when they were filming that sequence, it was you know they were filming it sort of in order as, as you might as you would. Uh, Charmin Carr actually accidentally fell through a pane of glass in that Jesus. gazebo that they were filming in, and ch- and like cut up her leg. So they had that the, the actual sixteen going on seventeen is one of the uh, the last sequences that they filmed in this movie. Interesting. Whoa. Yes. Well, I mean that is one of the scenes with the most choreography. Them yep. going around this gazebo uh, and and hopping up on the benches and then swirling around each other. I think is is really impressive, and mm-hmm. and not only because it's. Uh, very close to one shot like it's very long takes like so they're doing some very impressive choreography but a lot of it is shot in this really interesting framing choice of being outside the gazebo looking through the glass and having the rain coming down on both sides and like having it essentially sparkle like indirectly uh on on the glass that's you're looking through at them so you can't see them quite clearly but you can see the choreography clearly so i i, I think that was a really uh interesting and inspired choice visually with the um with that musical sequence, which is something we don't get like every time we're doing one of these numbers. Mm-hmm. As we said, it, it's still static, but it's like, oh, that's a really interesting framing choice. And I don't think it's that it, impressive. I could jump on the benches; I wouldn't have gotten hurt, <laughs> and not and not j- fly through a pane of glass. <laughs> I will I mean, say she was, she was fine by the time I actually lived with her. She was. No, there you go. That's good. Obviously. That's good. That's good. Uh, let's see. That's well, oh, speak, this, I, 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 yeah. Just yeah. quickly, so every start. time I see a gazebo now, this is the beginning of the gazebo trait, the gazebo trope. Uh, where have you not seen in other movies where two characters every time if you see two characters meeting up at a gazebo you know they about to kiss and it's just it's how it happens it's just yeah. it, it happens and every movie like and a, it or originates like from here there's like a fifty percent chance it's gonna rain in that se- in that scene too yeah if if you if characters are standing around outside the gazebo you know for damn certain that something's gonna come up in the plot that's gonna make them go inside the gazebo so that then they can get the loving on. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, let's see. Well, oh, speaking of Rolf, I like the confrontation between him and the captain at the end uh, when, yeah. you know, so, so he's sort of like trying to coerce him how to, out of being a Nazi and, you know, giving into this sort of nationalistic fear mongering that the Nazis, uh, you know, sort of thrived on and, 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 and um, you know, uh, took in, you know, sort of spoke to the, the insecurities of these young men in different countries to sort of ingratiate them into the Nazi regime. It's interesting to see. The captain, sort of a, a seasoned military man, tried to like coerce him out of that. He fails, yeah. obviously. Um, and I think that's another difference from the stage musical. I think that in the stage musical, Rolf purposefully lets them go, whereas in this, he you know he obviously tries to get them caught. Um, what, what I'd else? say oh. a good change. Yeah. Uh, let's see what else here. Oh, uh, I, I have I have two jokes that I wanted to shout out that I didn't get a chance to shout out, which is uh, two little things that Julie Andrews says. I love her comedic chops in this movie. Uh, but when they're talking about her dress that she has at the beginning, she's like, uh, "The poor didn't want this one." <laughs> yeah, you know it. And uh, when she forgets Kurt's name when she's praying, and then th- when they're all in there at the end, he's like, "Oh, Kurt, that's the one I forgot. God bless Kurt." And then uh, th- that's that's I love that too. Uh, I, I do but... think we should close on talking about Julie Andrews specifically because we touched on on her performance earlier, but she's ultimately the reason I like this film as much as I do. Yes. I like the cinematography. I like the, the concept of children. I find a couple of them annoying, but she consistently is why I'm invested in this film. Mm-hmm. It is She's such a different kind of nurturing motherly character. Is She isn't afraid to stand up for herself, and she's not quite sure where she where she feels at home for a lot of the film until she uh, ends up like that's her character arc is realizing that this family is for her and and uh being present with children is what she wants to spend her life doing and I've, i found that to be really powerful and plus she just has such a a uh a presence in her facial expressions and her her 
like exaggerated movements. One of my favorite yes. moments being when she's walking down the street in that long take, uh, arriving at the trap house. Uh, she's like swinging her arms around. She's got her her suitcase, and it's it's really a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, I house. I obviously love her in my this God. movie. Yeah, um, Julie Andrews is very really excellent. Tanner, do you know uh, about the singing in this movie? Um, did uh, they do their own singing, or did they get a a double for that? Julie Andrews did her own singing. Obviously, I mean, she's amazing. She's a ama- mm-hmm. she's an amazing vocalist. Um, I do believe that Christopher Plummer was dubbed over. Yeah, he was. Yes. Uh, so there's that. Oh, and obviously, you know, speaking to Julie Andrews, she obviously got a uh, Academy Award uh, nomination for her performance in this movie. Did not get the win. Mm. Um, but she did get the win the year before for Mary Poppins. So yeah, hey, beating. They- uh, Audrey Hepburn for My Fair Lady, the role that she was uh, that was supposed to be originally given to Julie Andrews because she was uh, in the My Fair Lady stage version. Yes, so it's, uh-huh. it's a whole it's a whole thing going on here. So web of uh, connections. Yeah. Other wins and noms here. Uh, obviously, this film won Best Picture. It also won Best Director for Robert Wise. Quite uh, quite earned, I would say. Again, we, we talked about this film is beautifully shot, and uh, I think that there's just a strong directorial vision behind all of this Mm -hmm. um it also won best sound best editing and best music obviously uh nominated for julie andrews in an actress in a leading role peggy wood in actress in a supporting role she was the uh the reverend mother uh also nominated for cinematography (sighs) art direction and costume design yeah i don't know about the peggy wood one but i she was good i mean you know she wasn't in it for like most of the movie yeah but yeah i mean supporting (laughs) <laughs> I guess they should have so. given one to Gretel. I liked Gretel like a Gretel? lot. Gretel, yeah. yeah, that's good. I I like. Uh, I'll just say this real quickly about the film, kind of as my as my closing thought. This is was quite an interesting film. I'm in this class studying um, the German emigres in Hollywood in the 30s, so about 30 years before this film was made, and this really feels like it's calling back to a lot of these um, traditions of. Teutonic cinema as well, like of German and Austrian filmmaking. It calls back to a lot of these older filmmakers and with all these names, with all these locations, um, the names of the characters and locations and like the sensibility of the film. I feel like it really takes from our tradition, you know, our Ulmers, our Wilders, all of these directors that came over as a result, uh, fleeing from the very Nazis that are there fleeing in this movie. The very same ones, in fact, they had they they wore the same brown shirts. I, I quite liked just my intellectual, you know, academic brain was like, ah, I, I could write an essay about this if I needed to. Sure. Yeah. Keep that one in your back pocket. Oh, yeah. It's Very in there. good. It's in there. Abrams, closing thoughts? Uh, closing thoughts. It's a really fun movie. I, I, I don't really know how much more there is to say than that. You know, sometimes we think about we think about these films and we say, but what, a, what of it as a best picture in X and Y and Z, you know, but I, but mm-hmm. I think that there are certain films whose quality sort of transcend any sort of archetypical shortcomings we talk about in terms of a quest film. Like, we didn't even touch... We didn't, I don't think we said the word theme one time in this movie. But, mm. but I think ultimately, similarly to some of the big blockbusters we've lauded quite heavily on the show, you know, Titanic, Return of the King, sometimes you just have a vision you execute it on in such a crowd-pleasing, technically proficient manner that it doesn't yeah. really matter what's missing. And for as much as I have issues, I mean, with sort of the structure of the film, as much as I think you could get this down to 2.30 and have it be an, an even better movie, I nonetheless had a very good time with it. And I think it's just a testament to sometimes sometimes the best the title of Best Picture is, is flexible. A lot of the times it isn't. A lot of the time we watch sort of yeah. the Best Picture archetype, um, but it's nice, to see, it's nice to see a film break that and break it really effectively. Uh, unlike something like Coda that ends up being like middling and whatever and not as good as Dune, but uh, <laughs> uh, no. Sound of music, a lot of fun. Loved it quite a bit. But shall we get into giving it a score? Giving it a score. Yeah. Oh, why oh, not? Uh, why not? Okay. Abram says it shall be so and thus it shall. <clears throat> I'm like, what number are we gonna give this movie? I don't really. Uh, oh, I got one. You gotta, you gotta spend got a more time thinking about it during the episode. Plugged I in. was thinking about it, but I just didn't come to a conclusion. Mm-hmm. 
It's all arbitrary, Timo. Just plug a number in. I've Who got cares? my number plugged in. Okay. Everyone let's... on the internet is going to say we're wrong and stupid anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> You're right about that. It doesn't matter. Here's let's find out episode. how wrong and stupid we are about the points of this film. In three, two, one. Doink. Boop. Okay, wow, we're very close. Pretty close numbers here. The average score after I reduce some decimal points is an 8.4. That's pretty up there. That's pretty high. The point breakdown, starting from the top, Ab or Tanner gave it a 9.1, followed by Tucker's 8.6, Abrams 8.1, and my 7.9. And I will, I, I will say that it's probably arbitrary. My 7.9. I was right oh. around 8, and I just decided to give it a 7.9. Yep. I was just well, thinking... Well, you right this into a tie, Timo. <laughs> no, it, it would have been, been a worse tie if, if, we, if he had gone up to an 8.5, because we have three movies at an 8.5, but only Versus one only at an 8.4. And that one movie at 8.4 is On the Waterfront, starring Marlon Brando, Elia Kazan directed. What do we have to say about the t these two films versus each other? Hmm. Here's what I'll I say. Mean, yeah. I think that this is this is sort of a, a point in time wherein quest for the best just might become a little nebulous because how do you really compare films of much different? Not I don't even really care about time periods, but sort of scales and intent. And what, and what I would say for me personally, on the waterfront, the power of its performances and sort of the clarity of its message and narrative to me mm. are are more remarkable maybe than this for, because for as much as I do enjoy the spectacle of. Um, Sound of Music, I forgot the title for a second. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think that it will stick with me. Maybe the way that a sequence like um, Marlon Brando getting up and getting the shit beat out of him on the dock over and over and over again mm. really will. I, I think that the, the potency and the power of that filmmaking is more effective than maybe the, the flowery feel goodedness of Sound of Music. Not to say that there's not ambition in Sound of Music, because there absolutely is, but... When I think of a success on this show, I think of a holistic success, and I think that there are clear elements. This film, basically, to completely contradict my um, my my statement I made about my thoughts overall, uh -huh. I'm more impressed by On the Waterfront. I think. Okay. I think that I gotta go with this movie over uh, On the Waterfront personally, and and I know that's maybe the unpopular opinion in in this cultural sphere. But the more we talk about this movie, the more I realize that. My uh my criticisms of it were more in the moment and maybe it's just because I hadn't I, I hadn't experienced this film in a very long time. And going at it through the lens of what we've been reviewing these best pictures as, this film isn't quite it isn't it isn't a similar list, it isn't Ben Hurt, it's not all these movies that do feel like they fit into this archetype of, of telling history through a dour lens and having very important themes and like powerful dramatic performances. This movie's largely lacking if not entirely absent of those things but i think abram makes a great point and something maybe i wasn't really thinking about too hard last night is the be the best picture name should should be flexible i think it should be more flexible than it is and this is the most enduring film of its year it is it is one of the most impressive cin cinematographically uh films of its time period and it, it absolutely holds up today in a way that some of these films from this earlier time period don't i mean it looks great and and uh, Julie Andrews is given a, an all-timer performance, and those songs just ha still have not left us 60 years later. Um, and while I like On the Waterfront, I gr grew a different appreciation of it reviewing it, that movie certainly has not stuck with me personally. I think those scenes you're mentioning are good, but it this feels like it sticks out in the Best Picture lineup. Even though we've got a lot of musicals, this is kind of the ultimate example of one of those, mm -hmm. and and for me, that, that puts it above on the waterfront. They don't if say someone... Palookaville in Sound of Music, though. They, they don't do say Palooka Palooka. Jimmit, They do. Which is maybe a better word than Palookaville. If only Vote someone the weeks ago, if only someone weeks ago uh, on this show had said that we should, may maybe, what does it mean to be a good or bad Best Picture winner? If only someone had said that. God. Anyway. <laughs> Did you say that? Uh, Timo, what are you going to say? That. No, no, okay. Um, Timo, what are you going to say? Because I don't want to go last. No, I don't want to go last either. Because oh, no. my my reasoning is not real; it's a joke reasoning. I I because I don't know how to divide these. I think Abram's right. We are in the nebulous. We're in a nebulous well, era, and these films are difficult to compare. I think they're they're quite different. And so the only way I can compare them is that the sound of music makes the Nazis bad, which I like. But yes. the the on the waterfront makes the unions bad, which I do not like. Oh. 
And so Sound so of Music, sound music. <laughs> will go on top of it. I, th- I, I, man, I don't know. Cause like the, oh, the cinematography and on the waterfront's great. Cause it's black and white and it's gritty and you got all the smoke and you're up. I'm going to say the Sound of Music goes above just to say it goes above. Cause I really actually don't think I can make up my mind on this one. Um, well, Timo, I'm glad you said that because as my scores indicate, I will be putting Sound of Music above, but I could have been convinced, um, you know, to, to maybe make a, make a concession there, but I don't have to. And I, 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 I can put the happy, fun, sugary time movie over the dark, dour, uh, poverty and, sh- and, and, and corrupt the, the unions movie. <laughs> Sound of Music forever, baby. Let's go. Well, there you have it. The Sound of Music is going to go above on the waterfront uh, pretty far up on our list actually up in the 8.4s that's going to put it at spot number 28 28 out of 80 that is a pretty good number uh in my book yeah yeah okay it's a good number in all of our books this is our this is our the great big book of quest movies uh, of good movies that is I only gave because... Bridge on the River Kwai a 7.1. Was I smoking a marijuana cigarette? That's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I <laughs> thought you might you have know, been. Abram, I was thinking the exact same thing when we were, t- when we were talking about that movie. <laughs> <sighs> oh, God, boys. We're, we're almost done. We're, what, we're uh, on movies going to give a bad score to next. <laughs> yeah, let's do a little singing, I think. Um, and, we, yeah, get in the spirit of this movie that we just talked about. Why don't we do it like the children did, um... In the last episode, and we all sing together. We can do that. Oh, as a, okay. as, a as a heavenly a- angelic little choir. Tanner, okay. you, Tanner, you gotta ba- you gotta wave your hands around like a, a conductor to get us started. <laughs> okay, here we Tim, go. Can you Ready? get this audio synced up when you do some audio editing afterward? <laughs> <laughs> okay, ready. On the count of three, here we go. One, two, three. Wheel, wheel, what's your deal? Give, Give us, us a movie, movie that makes us squeal. Is it on digital? Is it on digital? Is it on digital? Wheel, 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 what's your deal? Give us a movie that makes us squeal. Is it on digital? You said too many wheels, Abram. <laughs> well, that was a beautiful choir of singing. The uh, number you can read it right gross. there is harmonious. <laughs> it's very harmonious indeed. Number two, what's number two on the list now is somewhat recent isn't it yeah 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 we're we're getting out of oldsville and we're heading into newsville but we're not ah. heading to palookaville oh, uh we're going to be heading to the year 2007 let's fucking um, go watching here. watching the film directed uh by joel cohen and mm-hmm. his little, little brother ethan cohen starring josh <laughs> brolin javier bardem tommy lee jones woody harrelson kelly mcdonald and a uh, just a couple other fellas in this film uh, no country for old men. Oh mm. God! How many fucking weeks have I been asking for the wheel to give us no country for old men? <laughs> Every week, I hope it's going to be no country for old men, and then finally, I, is. I think it's been about two whole years, so about <laughs> over a hundred weeks. Now, Abram, the audience deserves an explanation as to why you want to get uh, no country for old men. Yeah, well, because well, here's the thing: I didn't like it very much. I've seen that movie before. I don't like it very much, but I've always felt like it's a movie that I should enjoy. And so I'm excited to revisit it because it's been many years. I watched it with my dad maybe five years ago. So it's, it's been plenty of time and I'd like to revisit it in the context of the show. Um, maybe like it this time. Yeah. Well, maybe. You, you guys all seen it before? I've Mm-mm. seen it before. I haven't seen it. No? Oh, Timo. No, Timo? Timo's the oh, only Timo. one who hasn't seen it. Yeah. So no I'll... Good for Old Men is a great movie and I can't wait to rewatch it. I'm looking forward to I, I watching it because great. I've heard that it is a great movie. And I've also heard that Abram doesn't like it. So I don't know what to think. I don't like it either. Yeah, Tucker also doesn't like it, so we'll we'll have a maybe a contentious one. We might have a oh, 50, so. 50 split. I'll probably maybe like T- it, or maybe Timo w- won't like it. I don't know. Who's to say? We'll find out next. There's time. absolutely no won't. way yeah. to find out what we're gonna what we're gonna think about the movie until you tune in next episode for us to talk about it. Thank you guys for joining me to discuss and sing our hearts out about the sound of music. I uh, I love talking about this film actually, even at well, I didn't expect to like it as much as I did, really. Yeah. I thought I was going to be pretty bored and pretty un- 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 unsatisfied, but yeah, this is just a straight-up good movie. That's all I can say. I think that's how we'll round it out. We will be back next time to discuss No Country for Old Men, and until then, wish you farewell and peace. Our oh, Vitter's in it, all that jazz, you know? Yeah.
missed opportunity, Timo. Come on now. As I was, as I was getting there, as I do many episodes, I don't. I know that there are opportunities based off of the film, and I'm thinking. I'm trying to think of them. I'm like. And then I just fail to think of them by the time my words reach the part where I need to, you know, make the bit. And then I'm like, okay. Mm, as a treat. Mm, 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 mm. All right. Well, this will go up on Wednesday then.